order here. Uh, true or false, it's impossible for anyone who believes on Jesus for eternal life not to express their faith to others. I'm eager to go, but I don't want to go first again. So who's who's eager to answer first? Actually, look, I think it's a, this was your question a long time ago. I'm just now getting around to it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I don't remember submitting it, but maybe I did. Uh, it was a while read ago. It, read, it, read it one more time, please. Okay, true or false? It's impossible. I think I reworded it slightly. It's impossible for anyone who believes on Jesus for eternal life not to express their faith to others. Okay. All right, well, let's just, if it, if it was my question, I'll go last anyway, but uh, let's see, Ben, why, why don't you go first on this one? Okay, I'll be very quick. Um, yeah, I would say, well, first of all, it's, it, you know, it depends on how long their lifetime is, you know. Uh, some people might believe right before they die. Some people uh, might believe and live their whole life. Either way, there's no guarantee that they will uh, ever express their faith um, to anyone. Um they, it, it could be for various reasons. One, they, they could be bitter with God, even though they have eternal life. They could be bitter about various things. They go, well, why can't everyone be saved? Or uh, even though, again, they understand the gospel, they might not just not be uh, able to reason uh, reason it through, you know, why God did the way that the things that he did or why God, why God's plan it is the way it is. Uh, they could be bitter about various things. They could be, uh, be fearful of looking foolish to other people. Um, or f fear of being persecuted. So uh, I think there's a lot of people uh, that never express their faith in Jesus, um, even if, again, they've had 80 years of life and they are believers all that time. It, it's possible, maybe unlikely, but it's pro it may be, uh, I wouldn't say it's impossible that someone could go by their whole life and not express um, their faith to others. Uh, and I, I, think, I think a lot of people, in some sense, people do, there are many people who you do not express their faith uh, to others, even though they they are uh, they are they're, they're expressing their faith. It's not specific. They always say, you know, that they, when they say, you know, they don't say praise Jesus, they say praise God, or they, they're always trying to be politically correct with the expression of their faith. In that respects, I, I see a lot of that. Um, that a lot of people are not willing to stand uh, firm not only on the name of Jesus, but the right gospel, so as to not to offend the, the you know people around them. So I think there's a lot of people that do not express their faith, at least accurately, um, in the way that I think a lot of us would like to see that, to see. That's my answer. All right, Angel, what do you say? Well, I would say, um, you know, I, I see nothing in the Bible that says that. And I think that... Uh, really that's you know I, I when I first uh you know like my first couple of years being saved like I I was so zealous and I and I I, I probably being you know unlearned at the time I would have told you that that was my opinion or that that uh you know that I I couldn't imagine that uh, you could be filled with the Holy Spirit and just never even feel compelled uh at least not compelled enough to actually follow through with professing you know your faith or professing the gospel sharing the gospel but um, that's why I'm I'm so uh, thankful that I have come to a, a you know a much a much better grasp of uh, you know even though I always understood and believed the correct gospel, just really understanding how important it is not to put those uh, litmus tests on people that aren't scriptural, um, because uh, you know like I, like I've said before, if God had to count on any little aspect of our character in order for us, you know, it's like even the most minor thing. Uh, in order for us to be saved, then we would all be damned. Um, that's why I've said it's like the lowest possible bar. Like he couldn't even, you know, be like, you'll pass the pass the whole class if you write your name on this piece of paper. <laughs> you know, he couldn't even do that. He just, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's because, you know, even even if he did, you know, they like 99% of the people, you know, wouldn't even wouldn't even do it. Um, and that's, you know, that's not even really a merit based thing. That's just like you think that'd be simple enough, but. Um, uh, I think that that's really not uh, taking into consideration uh, 
how like you know the nature of some people some people i i don't i've never related to it because i've even when i was wrong about basically everything i was i was quick to tell everybody my opinions i was very certain they were correct and i i never really related to people that were reserved or uh not outspoken um and so i've had a long you know lo long time to observe those people and really you know uh realize how some people are wired. And I do believe that is the flesh. I don't believe that, um, I, you know, I believe God does, you know, uh, wish that uh, that we would um, embrace the boldness that is offered to us by the Holy Spirit. But some people just, uh, you know, that's one of their weaknesses. Um, they don't know how to open their mouths in a lot of cases. You know, there's some people that are just very shy, very reserved, not um, like even if they're very, you know, certain of their their faith um they aren't they aren't certain of their ability to express it or uh, it's just sort of like a you know i guess some people could call it like a social anxiety there's others that depending on the situation you know it might it might be a life or death thing um and they might in that moment uh fail to trust god enough to preserve them um and that moment could extend over a lifetime um day to day uh, there's so there's many things that you know all of us even though we're here on the panel you know different promises in scripture that you know because we, we you know we can't really imagine um or we don't feel called to do it either but i mean you know there's there's uh, all of us could afford to be a bit more bold than we are most you know most of us i'm not you know, saying everybody and then there's just some people where that's just not their strong suit whatsoever um and uh you know they they may never they may never share you know maybe all with the closest people but i don't think it's impossible i don't see that i don't see how that's scriptural i don't i don't see that that was like the one caveat placed on on a person's conduct in terms of um uh determining their salvation as we know people are saved in a moment so um i yeah i would say that that is false mm -hmm. okay thank you all right uh sister lisa Well, I think it depends on who we're talking about, what the question when it says it's impossible for anyone who believes on Jesus for eternal life not to express their faith to others at some point in their lives. Well, it depends on who the others are. Because we know there's watchers, huh? the angels, the fallen entities, as well as the heavenly angels. And the Bible says they're witnesses to all these things. It even there's a passage in scripture that says people in heaven are rooting for us. They watching. So I was like, who, who are we talking about? If we're talking about others in life, then I would say that that's false. Because as someone pointed out so astutely, if a person makes a dead deathbed confession, no one even has to be in the room. You know, so uh, they might not ever get the opportunity to witness of Christ. Um, other people, uh, depending on, like, let's say you in a country where even professing your faith would be instantaneous death. And there are countries like that. You can't even have a Bible. They catch you with it. They cut your head off. So I'm not going to hold that against that person <laughs> if they don't. I, I don't know what kind of pressure that is. They have to endure. We ain't experiencing that yet. So uh, I say false, you know, uh, it you know, depends on what we're talking about. It depends on what's going on. It depends on what's really happening. But uh, I think that I think most people, if given the opportunity, most believers at some point, they end up sharing their faith. Usually the first people that they even witness to are the people uh, in their own home when they get saved. But like I said, then that's relative. There's some people who are single. There's some people who don't have any family. They don't have anybody. So, you know, it's, it's whatever their inner circle is or whatever. So it really, it just kind of depends on what we're talking about. So, you know, it's leaning true in some aspects and leaning false in others. So I'm torn on this one. I'd have to say it depends. I, there's no one that says depend on what we're talking about and i'm not undecided it just depends on the situation but for somebody to make a a question and say as an emphatic 
because the word it, that is an emphatic there is impossible. Well, then I would say that that's false. Um, because there are situations where it's not even possible for somebody to witness of Christ. As I, as I said, is a deathbed confession. Maybe somebody been preaching to somebody forever. They in a room by themselves. They in the hospital by themselves. They've heard the gospel. They knew it was true. They denied Christ their whole life, but they know they're facing impending death. And they finally just say, Lord, I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> I want, I know you real, you know, save me, Jesus. So, I, I have to say it's false on in that scenario. Okay, thank you. All right, Sister Heather. Um, I also said false. Um, and I I really liked what Sister Angel said, mainly because I am the person she she was describing. I am very shy at first, believe it or not. I am a pacifist. I'm withdrawn. I don't really speak out about stuff, but um, something that I have noticed about myself. Well, first of all, let me answer the question. The question I would say is false um, because there have been so many times in my life where I've had the opportunity to say something and I've locked up and not said anything and not because I didn't want to, but because I didn't have the words, they wouldn't come out or I didn't know how to express what I was trying to say or I was busy with something else and it was not the, the moment, the right moment, or there were other people around, or there was some other situation. But even in those situations, I found ways to show love and, and to show Jesus character um, to people. Um, one of the things that stands, one of the situations that stands out most in my mind was standing in line at Walmart and the woman in front of me gave the cashier such a hard time um, fussing at her about everything. And the, the woman was very obviously upset, looked like she was going to cry. And yeah, I probably could have shared the gospel at that point. But what I did instead is I shared a smile and I asked her about her day and I, I sympathized with her about the customer in front of me. And I listened, truly listened when she spoke to me and I loved on her to the point that before I left the store, she hugged, she asked if she could hug me and she hugged me. And so I, I believe that God did speak to her what she needed at that moment. Was it the gospel? No, but it was love. And that's what she needed to hear. Um, as far as, but, but, you know, then there are times where the same person um, I, I have found myself in a situation and it might be a little tense and I might have a little hesitation about what should I actually say, but then I find myself sharing the gospel and I'm, I think to myself, where did that come from? And I know where that came from. That came from the Holy Spirit speaking when he needed to, through who he need, whom he needed to, to the person that needed to hear it. So I, I you know, I, I say absolutely Anytime that you put the word impossible or always or never or anything like that in a question, it's always it's going to be false to me. So, Okay, thanks. I guess if I'm going last, that leaves you, Ben. I went first, uh, and I was brief. Oh, you did? Yep. You went first? Yep. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, well, first I'll answer the question and then I'll, uh, 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 apparently contradict myself, but my answer is certainly false. And I answer certainly false. Basically, I would ask you to listen to Angel's answer because that, that makes, makes me answer false that, uh, we cannot impose on anyone a litmus test that if they do not share their faith, uh, or if they do not have this uh, joy that I would expect someone to have when they understand what they've got, uh, that we can't impose those those reactions or responses or from, from someone as a test. Uh, okay, uh, so for that reason, the answer has to be certainly false. Um, However, let me give you a little parable here, a personal parable. Uh, 
Uh, I made a short video years ago, and I'll, I'll repeat it now. It's only maybe two minutes, but there's a certain man, uh, Luke, uh, it's me, and my doorbell rang, and I opened up the door, and there was a, you know, a whole bunch of vehicles and a whole bunch of people, and there's balloons and people speaking on loudspeakers, and they're out, they're all celebrating, saying, "Hey, you have just won ten million dollars from Publishers Cheering House." I mean, you you heard about that? This was not Publishers Clearing House. This is different. This is Publishers Cheering House. So um, they they not only told me that I. Out of nowhere, for no uh, no reason, I didn't do anything but to, to get it. But I got ten million dollars, and uh, then they said, and not only that, but any person that you tell about this, that then they also will get ten million dollars. Uh, to me, this is the picture uh, in. My, is uh, in my own words uh, of, of what uh, the, the, the our response to give us an idea of uh, what the natural response should be. First of all, if that actually happened to me, I would be jumping for joy, uh, wouldn't you? Come on, if 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 someone rang your doorbell and then they say, "I've got a check for you for ten million dollars and it's legitimate," and now you have, you would be jumping for joy. Who could not? be full of joy and so happy that, wow, maybe not only could you use the money, but you can use that to help so many other people who need need it. So you're, you're, who would not jump for joy? If someone is not full of joy, you'd have to wonder, what is wrong with that person? Do they not really believe that this is legitimate? Uh, and, then, and then if you're told that, hey, all you got to do is tell someone else about this, the fact that you got this, and then they can have it too. They'll get it too if you just tell them about it. I mean, who would not tell everybody, especially their friends and their family? You want to tell everybody, but especially those closest to you. You certainly would want them to get the $10 million too. If you didn't, how do you explain that? What is wrong with a person who would not share this good news about the $10 million? So this is how I uh, picture it as far as uh, what our response should be naturally. If we believe that we just received something that's so fantastic, the greatest thing you could possibly ever receive, far better than $10 million, eternal life, heaven, joy and bliss for eternity. Come on. I would have, uh, you, you have to be joyful. And then the other, you you would be jumping for joy. And then if, if you if you didn't tell others about it, knowing that they would all also get it, then uh, I, I, that says something about you. There's something wrong with a person that would not want to share that good news with others so that they can benefit also. Uh, now, so that's how I see that this should be the natural response. And yet I cannot impo impose it on others. I'm tempted because it's hard for me to understand if someone really understands the greatness of the gift and that they got it freely because of Jesus, that if they are not jumping for joy, I don't understand why not. I, I can't comprehend that. And if they don't want to tell others about it, knowing that they can get it too, it's free to everybody, offered to everybody, available to everybody, I don't understand why a person would not tell everybody, at least the people they, they love. Uh, and yet... As much as I don't get it, if they if they don't respond the way I expect, uh, I can't impose it on them. I cannot say that if you don't respond with joy, if you don't share the gospel afterwards, then you didn't really understand it or believe it. But it's hard for me to believe how a person would not have that kind of reaction or response to the gospel. Yeah, okay. I can, I, I yeah, can see ahead. someone. I can see someone like the, coming from lordship definitely having that reaction because they've been under condemnation their whole lives. But I think there's a lot of people that uh, just believe they're going to cease to exist. So what do I care if I live or die? What do I care if I have eternal life or not? It's just, I'm not, you know, it's some people, again, it, this, the sad state of affairs, it, not people are existential. Existentialism has permeated so much of our culture. 
Um, and again, a lot of people are just kind of like, you know, philosophical about it. Go, oh, well, if I die, it's okay. Uh, but if I get to live, okay, that's cool too, I guess. Um, and a lot of people would like maybe even a Jew under the law would assume that they, again, uh, assuming they have eternal life, uh, because they're keeping the law. And so they, you know, when they hear this good news, again, it, it's something they already thought they had. Now they realize it. Now they have it. Yes. But so, I, you know, for me personally, I, I can see a lot of reasons that, you know, in fact, I would t- tend to think the only people that really thought they were under cr- condemnation, would they really have that elation? And uh, I'm just such a person. I, I had that. Uh, in fact, I, I think most of my life, I, I assumed I got to go to heaven because Jesus died for my sins. But then I started getting... Uh, started reading the scriptures that didn't understand them and started re- reading the, some of these things that Jesus was saying, you know, pluck out your eye, whatnot. I, I knew they couldn't be true deep down, but at the same time, I couldn't refute them. And it just, it tormented me for uh, many years, well, probably a good year and a half to two years, where to the point where I, I literally felt like, I think I came close to death a couple times. Uh, so I, I could, again, I, I see your point, but I think a lot of people, again, assume they already have it. Or they assume that they cease to exist. So, uh, okay, well, change of plans. But, uh, you know, I guess that's good news. Again, I, th- I just think a lot of people are, uh, are uh, again, just very existential in their thinking. I, I, I will have to, okay, respond. Are we doing follow-ups? Can I respond? Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, so um, I, I see what you're saying. I have a hard time imagining that. Because I was very, well, yeah, existential. I, I kind of just, I guess I wouldn't say I was existential because I, to me that, that implies some sort of like um, uh, aloofness or indifference. I dreaded, uh, I dreaded my own mortality. Um, however, I thought, you know, I was, I was resigned to, to the idea that there was no way to possibly know uh, what would happen before we die until it's too late, right? And um uh, you know, uh, that, that somehow seems like a better outcome than finding out someone had ultimate authority over me. <laughs> and the thing is, though, is that it's not just that you're not just joyous because you were under condemnation. I like I agree, Ben, I never I, I, I was in denial about God and all of these things. So I didn't really feel under condemnation, except the condemnation to mortality, to death itself, not hell, just death itself. Um, and then to find out that uh, it, it's not so much just that, okay, you're not gonna just cease to exist or, or whatever like oblivion you imagine, but that you actually are gonna live uh, eternally and happily ever after uh, uh, paradise, like you're beyond your wildest dreams. Um, and that it, and it's not just so much like a match, you know, oh, I'm so excited about all the fun, all the fun toys God's gonna give me in eternity. No, it's the fact that you know that you get to have a happy ending. You get to stop fearing uh, what's, uh, <laughs> Because that, that's the thing I, 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 you know, it's amazing that I never realized it when I was an unbeliever that um, life, it, well, and I did eventually, that's, you know, and right before I became a believer, I realized what a cruel, sadistic, futile experience uh, existence was if there wasn't a sure promise of, uh, uh, of an eternity uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in happiness, uh, you know, like not, not an eternity in this state, but an actual, like, you know, happily ever after, like we all have this archetypal uh, uh, understanding of what that is, uh, you know, paradise, right? Um, and um, where you don't have to be afraid, you don't have to be afraid of what's coming, because I remember back as just a little kid, had, uh, I was, I couldn't even sleep by myself. And it partly, yeah, I was scared of like, of demons and things like that. Uh, sleep paralysis, but it, more than anything, the dor- demons tormented me, I believe, uh, because I did have sleep paralysis. But I think before the sleep paralysis even would kick in, it was when I'd fall asleep. And I started at from such a young age uh, going, like I, I would try not to, but I would realize that um, when I'd go lay down at sleep at night, I would, I would start to realize about how in just a few years, surely someone I love dearly would be dead, you know, especially my grandmother. And that that would just be the first of many. And there was no escaping it and no avoiding it. And there was, and you know, as a little kid, you look forward to the future. You think about how you can get driver's license one day, blah, blah, blah. But I, I was too tormented by the fact that I would eventually one day lose my, my loved ones, my parents, things like this, to even allow myself to look forward to those milestones. Because as soon as I would even think to, 
a thought would come in my mind. Yeah, would Granny be dead by then? By the time you're 16, probably. Like, or what? You know, what if what if your dad's dead by then? Like, I couldn't even. I had no joy from such a young age um, because of the 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 the, 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 the uh, cruelty of death. Um, and I've said it before. I'll you know I'll say it many times. You know, why do we love with a love that it demands eternity without the promise of tomorrow? It just was, it's it's a it's a cognitive dissonance that most unbelievers live in their whole lives and they don't understand it. That's really what underlies their misery, uh, because you're you're as a human you cannot reconcile those two things. You cannot reconcile the fact that you're um, kind of accumulating these uh, people that you treasure and these moments that you treasure, these memories, and without without at least having maybe you have a false belief. You know, maybe you believe in a false god and a false religion and a false afterlife. That's one thing. But for the unbelieving, like you're talking about with the existential uh, type people. Um, they're basically insane all the time because they've never reconciled these two most fundamental uh, aspects of human existence. And it torments them subconsciously all the time. Because what is the point of anything that you're doing? And the farther you go on, the more you go, the longer you live, the more children you have, the, you know, the longer you're with your husband or your wife and the deeper you love them, uh, the, the more cruel <laughs> your existence is because you believe that uh, most likely it's all for literally nothing and your life is shorter you know it, it might as well be a mayfly you know when it comes to our our consciousness and you know, how humans are you know uh we have such a tiny short lifespan with the with the way that you know the, the depth of our emotions and the, and our experiences it's it's it, and, and the fact that it doesn't motivate more people to realize that they really need to get serious about figuring out what they can figure out about why we're you know why we're here and and, and and also just to see that Genesis explains it all, and only Genesis does, explains exactly that very conundrum about the human nature uh, and the human condition, um, and gives an the, the only the only promise that makes sense, the only explanation for any of these things um, when you when you compare um, the 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 fact that we, we we've never managed to accept death, even though supposedly according to evolution. We've always known death. Why would it be so unbearable then? Why would we have never figured out a way to like, you know, truly cope with it? Why does it torment us the way it does? I know it tormented me before I ever even lost anyone. So I would disagree though, that, that, uh, that people just like, like, like a lot of people that don't share it, like they just like, you know, uh, ho-hum about the whole thing, because I think a lot of people are under a condemnation that uh, is different than Lordship. You know, it's just the condemnation of, of the uh, inevitability of death with no answers. And not just death, death is like, you're, my own death I never worried about, really. Uh, it, it was the death of my loved ones. And although you believing doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that it doesn't necessarily fix that problem unless you you know manage to, to help bring loved ones to faith. But the point is, is that you, you know, you're, you're excited to find a solution, but it is possible at least to 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 uh, for you and your loved ones to spend eternity together um and so i i i, I do think more people uh, if they don't consider these things i think they should but um i think that's why i tend to think that uh a lot of people i think it's really like well heather explained it you know and heather uh i'm so glad she's actually you know come on the panel i could tell heather you're not like the most like at first the most outgoing extroverted person but then once you're and, and I'm kind of like that, like I'm nervous about the approach of it, but then once it's happening, I'm like, you know, totally, uh, I don't, I can talk to anybody, but um, I don't, uh, I don't like to feel like I'm imposing on people. So sometimes for me, um, like I could never street preach. I just don't know how any, but it's like, I, I really admire that, but I, I don't know if I could ever do it. Um, so I think that a lot of times it's just kind of like our own selfish, um, you know, our, our, our weaknesses, what makes us uncomfortable. Um, and some people are more driven by that than others. Um, you know, and I think a lot of men, especially men are not super uh, communicative in, in general, like, you know, like a lot of men at least. And so um, I think you'll probably let, like, I can imagine a lot of guys that get saved, uh, but they're not, they never ever become like real serious about it, serious about ministry. Uh, they just kind of keep it to themselves, you know, uh, you know, my, my dad is very quiet and reserved um, and, He's a very, you know, true, he's a true believer in Jesus and always has been. But, you know, my dad is a man of few words. So 
you know, and that, you know, hey, listen, that's going to cost him, you know, probably something internally that he didn't, uh, that he didn't take up a, you know, a ministry of some form, but, um, you know, I know God understands these things about us, so. Um. All right, thank you. Uh, well, Sister Lisa uh, has to leave soon, so let, let me give you an opportunity to uh, see if you have any more to say about this question, and, and, and also, if you need to leave, you can give us your, your final thoughts, Lisa. Oh, okay. Thank you, Brother Luke. Uh, first, before I uh, begin to, to, to say good evening and uh, it, give my final thoughts, I uh, just want to say, uh, Sister Angel, this is why I asked you to be on my broadcast. Um, oh. See, you come from a totally different perspective than my experience because yeah. I grew up always believing, always, and, and, and you think about things that I would never have an experience with because that's not the position I came from. And, right. and vice versa. I just, yeah. And I just love when you, when you say some of the things that you say, because you made such salient points about uh, things to consider. Like when you said about why would you have the expectation of eternal? In other words, I'm going to marry somebody and I want to be with you forever. And people uh -huh. make these declarations, but they don't believe in eternal life or they don't believe there's a God out there somewhere. So it, it right. doesn't make sense that they have that expectation in their spirit and then even right. their belief system, yet mm -hmm. they don't realize the absolute glaring contradiction in that statement right. if they actually believe what they claim they believe. That, exactly. It, <laughs> that was saying, yep, yep. That, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a spiritual blind spot. It is, it is, all, it is like, spiritual blinders. And and I think that's when the Lord gives us opportunities, like what you just did, to point out that glaring contradiction, that they are actually hardwired for eternity. Mm -hmm. And the Bible talks about that. I told you I pointed to that book the gentleman wrote about eternity in their hearts for people for all cultures yeah. around the world, okay, that have that expectation. But but anyway, I digress. Um, I wanted to also say uh, in, a, in another point uh, about this question. Uh, in that I wouldn't I wouldn't worry so much. I mean, people who know they have a calling, they know if they're being dis disobedient by not honoring a calling on their life. Right. Okay. It would be unjust for God to judge you for a calling that you didn't even know you had. Right. Okay. So um, but uh like like you said about your dad, like maybe he wasn't maybe he didn't have a, a calling on his life to do anything it's other for animals, than, apparently. It's like he's well, the it, most it, kind man maybe, to animals, but at the same time, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned how your dad had this friend who was wounded that was a homosexual yeah, and ended yeah, up yeah, essentially true. becoming asexual. Right. Well, maybe his one of his ministry or calling or appointment was to minister to that man. See, we diminish yeah. things and we don't realize, and I'm not saying you did, don't misunderstand me. I'm saying we don't realize we discount things that are critically important. Right. Uh, it, it, it's not the number with God. You remember how he started with 12. So it's not the number necessarily. It's it's the, the actual catching that person. He said, I'm going to yeah, make you fish as a special men. case where you're, you're exactly. going to go after a few really hard cases. But all exactly. You could do, right? Maybe in your whole life, you only minister to four people. But it, it required right. a constant level of dedication. You can't minister to 100 people, critically close, constant interaction. You can't do that. You, 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 right. You're only one person. But two or three, maybe four people where you're helping them and nurturing them and leading them and guiding them and directing them and discipling them in a way, hey, that's that's something a lot of people can't even do. So that's why I say y'all get before God and ask him what your ministry is because everybody, you all have something. You all have a gift. And then.